A few months back in October of 2022, the Nobel Prize for Physics was awarded to John Clauser, Alain Aspect, and Anton Zeilinger. You probably saw some headlines about it. Nobel Prizes usually make headlines, but these were a bit more bombastic than most, claiming that basically they had proven that the universe isn't real. You thought this channel gave you an existential crisis. But in this case, we've got a rare switcheroo, where the news headlines make you question the whole nature of reality, and I'm here to say... Eh, when did I become a debunking channel? The fact that this was awarded the Nobel Prize is really more of a confirmation of theories that have already been widely accepted in the science community for a long time now. I've even talked about them here on this channel. But it is interesting stuff, and it does definitely reinforce the idea that the universe is way weirder than we can possibly imagine. Um, especially at the smallest scales. So let me do my amateur best at breaking this down. No, the universe is not locally real. But here's what that actually means. So on this channel, I get corrected a lot. Like, a lot. <laughs> I'm sure many of you are warming up your hands to straighten me out in the comments of this video already. Like one thing that I get called out a lot, and, um, and this is super pedantic, but we're talking about internet comments here, is that whenever I use the word theory in the casual general audience kind of way. Like if I said that I have a theory about why butts have cracks, right? Like people will be quick to point out that it's really more of a, a hypothesis. And then ask if I'm okay. And yes, in a scientific sense, my butt crack idea is more of a hypothesis to be tested and not, you know, a theory to serve as a basis for knowledge for other things. But I mean, the word theory does have a more casual use that, you know, lay people use in the everyday world that doesn't really mean the exact same thing as, say, a research scientist when they use it. And what we're talking about here today is, is it's kind of the same thing. You know, when physicists say the universe is not locally real, there's a different scientific meaning to those words than the layperson might hear. Luckily for science communicators and nerdy websites, that layperson meaning is pretty clickbaity. So let's break this down. What does it mean to say that the universe is not locally real? Also, keep in mind, I'm not an actual scientist, but uh, I'll do my best. Anyway, to start, let's go back in time. Oh, too far. Uh, let's jump ahead a little. Okay, this works. So ever since scientists and philosophers existed, they have pondered the nature of light because some experiments seem to show it behaving like a wave, some like a particle. This was a problem that vexed the greatest thinkers of their day like Thomas Young and Sir Isaac Newton. Flash forward to 1905 and Albert Einstein built on the work of Max Planck to show that light can be divided into discrete quantities called photons. In other words, he showed that light was a particle and there was much rejoicing. The problem is, they only acted like particles when they were emitted and when they were absorbed. When they were moving through space, they still acted like waves, which is something that all quantum objects frustratingly seem to do. Or according to Max Born, the German-Polish mathematician and grandfather to Olivia Newton-John, no, really, as he said about his work with quantum collisions, quote, one does not get an answer to the question, what is the state after collision, but only to the question, how probable is a given effect of the collision? From the standpoint of our quantum mechanics, there is no quantity which causally fixes the effect of a collision in an individual event. What Born was advocating for here is called the Statistical Approach to Quantum Mechanics, or QM. And to translate that to all of us non-grandfathers of Olivia Newton-John, basically it means that until a quantum particle is measured, it has no definite values. It only exists in a statistical probability. It's like saying that if an archer fires an arrow, from the moment it leaves the bow until it hits the target, it only exists as a cloud of probabilities. Obviously with a macro object like an arrow or a baseball or a cow, that's totally absurd. But in the quantum world, that's, that's just how things work. And that was proven true in experiment after experiment after experiment. And that's QM, quantum mechanics. Many of you already know about this, but at the time, this was a radical new science. Promoted by Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, and Max Born, they're kind of considered the founding fathers of QM. Does that make quantum mechanics Olivia Newton-John's father? I'll stop now. One person who wasn't on board with this idea of statistical QM uh, was Einstein. Einstein hated this idea. In fact, he wrote in a letter to Max Born in 1947, quote, I cannot seriously believe in it because the theory cannot be reconciled with the idea that physics should represent a reality in time and space 
free from spooky action at a distance. Stick a pin in that spooky action at a distance thing, we'll, we'll get back to that. Einstein and those like him became known as realists because they believed that a particle was a particle was a particle was a particle. It was a real thing from start to finish. This whole idea that a tiny piece of actual matter could become a math equation was ridiculous to them. Likewise, statistical thinkers like Born, Heisenberg, and Bohr are known as non-realists because they believe that's exactly what happens. I should point out that individual theories vary and there's probably as many nuances on, on every single aspect of this as there are people who take each side. So to go back to our original statement, the universe is not locally real. The real part of that refers to this argument, whether or not an unmeasured particle exists as a physical particle or as a statistical probability. So in other words, Einstein was wrong, but he didn't go down without a fight. There was a big, huge, famous conference that happened right in the middle of this melee called the Fifth Solvay Conference, where Einstein and Bohr had it out in a big debate. And Einstein basically challenged other realists to prove the non-realists wrong, which led to a whole slew of thought experiments, the most famous of which is Schrodinger's cat. Yeah, apparently Erwin Schrodinger had a great aunt who was kind of a, a crazy cat lady, so uh, it's only natural that he imagined putting one of them in a box. Now, most of you are probably familiar with Schrodinger's cat, the idea that, you know, if you put a cat in a box with a vial of poison, and that vial of poison would either break depending on the behavior of a, a quantum particle. The argument being that if unmeasured particles are just probabilities, then until you look in the box, the cat is both alive and dead at the same time, which is obviously ridiculous. Which I always thought that Schrodinger's cat was just sort of like a thought experiment to sort of explain quantum mechanics, like it was an educational tool, uh, but he was actually arguing against it. I think a lot of people get confused by that. I know, I know I did. Something else a lot of people don't know is that in this very same paper where he outlined the, the cat experiment, he also first coined the term entanglement. This was actually inspired by another paper that year from Einstein and two other physicists, Boris Podolsky and Nathan Rosen. In this paper, they tried to prove the realist case by using the concept of entanglement, but it was so new they didn't really have a term for it yet. It was actually Schrodinger who named it in his cat paper. So, entanglement. What is that exactly? Well, simply put, it's when the value of a property of one quantum object implies the value of the matching property in another. Simpler put, it's when the properties of two particles are linked. Electrons, for example, have a property called spin, and it's possible to entangle two electrons so that their spin will measure as opposite. So if you measure the spin of one of them as clockwise, you know that the spin of the other one is counterclockwise. Although electron spin is not quite the same as like the spin of a basketball, it's a different thing based on angular momentum, but for both of our sanities, let's just leave that for another time. But still, even if both of the particles are entangled, you only know that after measurement. Before that, they're both just, you know, statistical probabilities. So Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen asked what happens when the entangled objects are separated and you measure the value of one of them. Does the other one just snap out of statistical probability? And if so, how does it know to do that? This is the spooky action at a distance that I was talking about earlier, also known as the EPR paradox named after Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. So in their paper, they argued that there, there, there must be something else going on here. You know, you can't just have two particles communicate with each other instantaneously across space and time. That just makes no sense. So they suggested that if you can predict the quantum object's properties, something has to make those predictions come true. They named that something hidden variables. So non-realists say that hidden variables don't exist. Physics is just pure statistics. It's nothing but math all the way down, which is the most hellish version of reality I can think of. In the years after the EPR paper was published, there were several different hypotheses put forth with different takes on hidden variables. The problem was that the technology wasn't quite there to actually experiment on this and test it. Einstein spent the last several years of his life trying to get to the root of this problem, and he never quite got there. In fact, it would be nine years after he died before somebody even figured out a way to test that the universe was real. And that test had to do with the local part of the headline. I swear to God, I just keep doing this. In physics, locality means that no two objects can influence each other faster than the speed of light. Einstein believed in locality. It was a big part of his special theory of relativity. So local doesn't necessarily mean close to each other. Um, light from Alpha Centauri is local. It just takes 4.3 years to get here. So to Einstein, a complete theory of physics would explain particles as real and their influences as local. In other words, locally real. But some in the realist camp weren't so picky. Take pilot wave theory. Um, I did a video about this a little while back, but it was proposed by David Bohm. Anyway, with pilot wave theory, the universe is real, but not local. And in the paper where he proposed pilot wave, Bohm and his academic advisor, Yakir Aronoff, outlined a theoretical experiment to test the paradox using our old friend, particle spin. Theoretical is the key word here. They, um, 
didn't really quite know how to pull it off. But in 1964, the Irish physicist John Bell read the paper, and he was inspired to figure out the spin experiment. Yeah, so far in this video, I've talked about Bohr, Born, Bohm, and Bell. Anyway, what Bell did was he came up with two formulas, one that would reflect a universe with locally real hidden variables, and one that reflected a non-realist QM. In long explanation, mercifully truncated, when Bell ran the formulas, he found out that they actually disagreed. The outcomes were fundamentally different in the universe with hidden variables from the one without. And his big takeaway from all that razzmatazz is that local hidden variables and quantum mechanics don't mix. It's an idea that's now called Bell's theorem or Bell's inequality. In mathematics, an inequality is a formula where two sides are not equal. So like one plus two equals three is an equality, but two plus two is greater than three is an inequality. So in Bell's example, QM does not equal hidden variables. So yeah, inequality. But to prove this theorem requires more than fancy math, you gotta do an experiment which he proposed and he called it the Bell test because he likes putting his name on things. But once again, uh, the technology to perform this test was not available yet, it didn't exist. So coming up with runnable Bell tests and using those results to shed light on physics is how John Clauser, Alain Ospecht, and Anton Zeilinger won the Nobel Prize. And I mean shed light literally, because they used photons to test the Bell inequality, but photons act differently than the particles that Bohm and Aronov proposed using for checking for spin in their work. All right, so in 1969, John Clauser teamed up with the physicist Abner Shimini, Michael Horn, and physics student Richard Holt to work out how to use them in a Bell test. By the way, I know I'm throwing a lot of names out there right now. Uh, you don't need to know them all. You just kind of need to know them for context because they are reflected in some of the terms that you've heard before. So just bear with me here. Anyway, they kind of broke from the original idea that Bell had because Bell imagined using or measuring the spin of these particles as perfectly up or perfectly down, uh, which is incredibly hard to do with photons. So Clauser and his colleagues just kind of relaxed that rule. The result was an experimental setup that was using light to test the Bell inequality while accounting for imperfect results. And in 1969, it was named the CHSH inequality. And now you know why I said all those names earlier. Yeah, and you're gonna have to forgive me for being intentionally vague uh, when I'm talking about some of this in this video. Um, this is literally stuff that Einstein couldn't come up with. So yeah, I, I, I know my limits. But simply put, any experiment that violates the CHSH inequality disproves hidden variables and is considered proof of statistical quantum mechanics. Still with me? All right. So three years later, Clauser and his colleague Stuart Friedman ran the first successful Bell test, and their results violated the CHSH inequality. And somewhere in the afterlife, Einstein cried. Actually, Clauser was also disappointed. He later admitted that he wanted to shake the world with a hidden variable win. I mean, he'll just have to settle for a Nobel Prize instead. But he shared this prize with two other people because there were still some loopholes in the theory and they helped close them. So let's talk about Elon Aspect real quick. Okay, so first of all, a year after Clauser's big experiment, so 1973, Richard Holt ran a separate test. Holt, if you remember, was one of the H's in CHSH. I, I don't know which one. But his test actually satisfied the CHSH inequality. So maybe hidden variables were a thing. But his hidden variable kind of acted like a ghost in the machine. It was kind of determined by how the measurement was done. But Lon Aspect broke the tie by introducing a random element to his measurements so that the measuring devices couldn't influence each other. Specifically, he changed the polarization of the photons while they were on their way to a filter. Uh, the filter would either block photons or let them through depending on the polarization. All this randomness led Aspect prove that his measuring devices weren't predetermining the outcome. Anyway, this was a big hit in the physics community and it continually violated the CHSH inequality in multiple runs and labs all over the world. This was another nail in the coffin to the hidden variables theory and a big win for the non-realists. But the theory still wasn't 100%. There were still a couple of objections and loopholes that the realists would point out. And that's when Anton Zeilinger stepped in and said, hold my pangalactic gargle blaster. Apparently he's a huge hitchhiker, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fan. So Zeilinger did his test in 1998, but long before that, he had worked with entangled particles. There's actually a, a type of entanglement named after him called the GHZ state. The Z stands for Zeilinger. His experiment addressed some of the objections to Aspect's test, which was that the method of polarization was predictable into the future. In other words, his, his randomization wasn't random enough. So what they did was they used a physical random number generator that took the form of light emitting diode and a beam splitter. The light from the diode was non-polarized, so the chance of it exiting the splitter in one of two directions was as random as anything science can get. And they also placed their measuring devices so far apart that they could eliminate any chance of them communicating with each other. But anyway, as you may have guessed, it worked. It closed the last loopholes and objections to the Bell test, and to date anyway, 
no result to seriously challenge the completeness of statistical quantum mechanics. In other words, the non-realists were right, Einstein and the realists were wrong, quantum mechanics is super weird. So like I said before, none of this is anything that you probably haven't already heard. We all know that the quantum world is weird. Hell, it's a major plot point in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This year's Nobel Prize simply honors a physicist whose work proved this theory beyond a shadow of a doubt. And rightfully so. But because of the language used in the announcement, there are all these headlines saying that, you know, the universe isn't real, like they prove simulation theory or something, which, no. Frankly, I take offense to this because it's my job to give people existential dread, buddy. So no, this doesn't change anything about the world that you live in. You still have to go to work tomorrow. Sorry. On the upside, the more we understand about quantum mechanics, the better our future quantum computers could be. Anton Zeilinger, in particular, has built a career on using entanglement to push the boundaries of quantum computing. Maybe someday there'll be a Nobel Prize for quantum computing. And the headlines will say something like, God is found in cheese, or something. So listen, when it comes to quantum entanglement, um, I'm a filmmaker. There's some details that I totally left out in this video because, like I said before, I know my limits, but I'm putting links to everything in the description. Lots of links, links to the actual studies and whatnot. You can go look at them yourself. I just thought I'd talk about this because I had a lot of people request it. Um, it took me a while to get this out, but hopefully it maybe filled in some gaps of what you've already seen because I know a lot of other people have already covered it. Other people like Brian Greene, who covers this in his series Exploring Quantum History on CuriosityStream. This is a three-part series that tells the whole history of quantum mechanics, so if there's anything you weren't completely following in this video, it'll clear all that up. And it's hosted by author and physicist Brian Greene, and he always does great stuff. And that's just one of dozens of shows and series on quantum mechanics on CuriosityStream, on top of thousands of titles and other topics, science, history, art, anything you're curious about. You know where else you can find extra info? On this video. On Nebula. Yeah, I post every one of these videos on Nebula at least a few days earlier than I post here on YouTube, and in place of an ad read, like you're watching right now, uh, I started putting some extra facts in the Nebula videos. There's, there's a couple on this one. Nebula is a really awesome streaming service built by a bunch of great YouTubers and science creators, and I'm really happy to be a part of it. I know I've been promoting Nebula on here for a long time now, but there's seriously like some really cool stuff starting to happen on there. There's over 130 creators posting original and extra content, some really great exclusive series. I have two on there as we speak, including my Forgotten Atrocities series, which I'm still adding to. Plus there's now Nebula classes where you can learn skills from your favorite creators. Seriously, if you haven't checked it out, go check it out. It's $5 a month. You can save a little bit by signing up for the annual plan, but the real hack is when you sign up through the Curiosity Stream bundle. If you go to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott and sign up for the bundle, you'll get an email and then you can use that email to click on the thing, go to a link, sign up for Nebula, and you will get both services for $14.79 for an entire year. It's an amazing deal and it supports the channel and you'll get to see more stuff from me, which I mean, come on, <laughs> that alone, right? So anyway, it's curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, links down in the description. Before we leave, big thanks to the answer files on Patreon and the channel members who are supporting this channel, forming an awesome community. I can't imagine doing this without them. I've gotten to know so many people who are Patreon members and, and, uh, and YouTube channel members. It's, it's, uh, it's really cool having these guys around and they've been helping me out quite a bit. Anyway, I've got some new people I need to shout out real quick. We've got Kimber Cole, uh, Kervin Sugata, Marnie Beaton, Eric Red, Jason Armstrong, Chris Etheridge, Usman Ajmal, uh, Mark Canning, Squashatelic, R2, and Autumn Arabella. Uh, those are new members who have signed up. If you would like to join them and get early access to videos, access to exclusive live streams, and get a cool little button next to your name in the comments to make you stand out from all the rest, just hit the little join now button down below. Cool t-shirts and merch available at the store at answerswithjoe.com slash store. Um, we got a whole new store experience coming soon. There's going to be some really cool stuff happening, but we got a whole lot of new t-shirts that you can go check out. Um, there's also some cool buttons and and keychains, you want a little keychain on my face on it? Hey, look at that. Um, anyway, it's all there. Go check it out, answersjoe.com slash store. Really helps support the channel. Thank you. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video. Maybe I'll put the, the pilot wave video up here. Yeah, I'll link to it earlier. I'll put something there. Anyway, uh, check out that video. Google thinks you'll like it, or you can check out any of the videos if you're watching on your browser on the sideline over here. I have my face on the thumbnail. Go check it out. If you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe because I do come back with videos every Monday. Only if you enjoy them. If you hate them, don't do that to yourself. It's not worth it. But anyway, that's it for today. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.